Today I'm interviewing Curtis Moore, who is Vice President of Marketing and Corporate Development for Energy Fuels. Good, mo good morning, uh, Curtis. Good morning, Jack. Nice to see you. Can you please, Energy Fuels has been much in the in the uh, news lately, and I'd like you to, to give us uh, a summary of Energy Fuels' pl long-term plans and where you are in those plans today. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to happy to do that. So um, for those that don't know, Energy Fuels has been a uh, producer of uranium for a long time, uh, uranium being the, the fuel for nuclear energy. Uh, but a few years ago, uh, we started to look at our business in a much more expansive way. Uh, and we realized that we actually had a very unique and important role to play in a number of other uh, commodities. Um, we have a facility in the state of Utah in the United States called the White Mesa Mill. It's the only conventional uranium mill in the United States. But as a result, it has the ability to process a lot of different feedstocks uh, that are naturally radioactive. They're naturally radioactive because they have uranium and thorium and other uh, radionuclides associated with them. Um, but a lot of those feedstocks contain things like rare earths and medical isotopes and other such things. And so um, that's what brought us into the rare earth industry about four or five years ago. Um, and then uh, as we uh, realized that we needed to uh, secure our own uh, sources of feedstock to produce uh, rare earth elements at that facility, uh, we got into what's known as the heavy mineral sand industry, uh, which are primarily titanium and zirconium mines, but they produce an extremely valuable uh, byproduct uh, called monazite and to a lesser extent, uh, xenotime, uh, that are some of the best rare earth bearing minerals in the world. Now, again, monazite and xenotime have a little bit of uranium and a little bit of thorium in them that you have to deal with. Um, but we, over the last several years, have proven up our ability to extract rare earths, to separate rare earths um, at our facility in Utah. Um, and uh, at the same time, we've secured some of the best heavy mineral sand projects in the world. So look, in the, in the next several years, we're probably going to be one of the largest, if not the largest producer of titanium and uh, zirconium. So uh, that is the that is the long-term plan. Um, Right now, we're focused on uranium production because uranium prices are very good, um, and there's a lot of interest in nuclear energy, uh, you know, for reasons of uh, reducing uh, uh, carbon emissions and that sort of thing. But that's given us time also to kind of build up our rare earth business and heavy mineral sand business. So I think we're emerging as probably one of the, the you know the best uh, uh, non-Chinese uh, uh, critical mineral companies in the world right now. Okay, uh, actually, I'm I'm going to top that. You are the best company for that in, in the Americas, in my opinion, because my opinion is that you've done the right thing, which is your, your CEO is a long experience mining development and producing executive. Your company has substantial revenues and a market cap of around a billion dollars. The word junior just simply doesn't apply to you unless you have a a son who is uh, with that title. So you are the actual only real mining company today in the Americas in the rare space. And this, I think, is a huge advantage. So uh, you're, you're right about heavy mineral sands. Most people, I'd say 99.9999% of the people don't have any idea what that is. And it's not necessary to define it. OK, except that it, it is our source of zirconium, a lot of titanium and in large quantity, substantial amounts of, of monocyte. Now, it's my understanding that uh, your company has plans to go downstream further than separation uh, without revealing any corporate secrets. Can you give us like a hint about that? Sure. You know, at the end of the day. If you're a, uh, a a user of rare earth magnets, whether you're uh, a manufacturer of electric vehicles or plug plug in hybrid electric vehicles or wind energy or military and defense uh, uh, equipment and that sort of thing, you don't need rare earth oxides, right? And so that is what we have proven up our capability uh, to do is to produce commercial quantities of rare earth oxides. But at the end of the day, you can't put NDPR oxide into a into a Tesla. You can't put NDPR oxide directly into, you know, a wind generator. 
And so uh, what those end users really need are magnets. And so uh, we are currently evaluating the potential to get farther downstream in the rare earth supply chain. So right now, I would say that we've already sort of solved a half or even more of the rare earth supply chain, kind of the upfront part. That's the mining, that's the crack and leach, and that's the, uh, the, the chemical separation of the rare earths. Uh, the next step is to turn that oxide into a metal. Then you have to alloy it. Then you, uh, then you, uh, then you create a magnet. Um, those are extremely important steps, and there are good margins associated with those steps as well, by the way. And so I won't talk too much about what we're doing on that front. Um, I'll tell you we're looking at a lot of opportunities right now. There's already a lot of interest just in our oxides, just to be clear as well. Um, and uh, our oxides have been uh, getting qualified by magnet manufacturers around uh, ex-China around the world. And, and so far, everything just looks perfect. They, 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 want, they want as much as they can get. Um, but I think we would be remiss to not look farther downstream and to be able to capture that whole opportunity. So you can go to those end users and say, here's, here's the metals, here's the alloys, here's the magnets that you need. That's, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you have to be responsive to your customers. Uh, one thing I did notice from your public disclosures is that you're developing what's probably the world's largest heavy mineral sands undeveloped source in Madagascar with your acquisition of the of base resources and you're developing a similar uh, heavy mineral sands project in Australia with your your joint venture with Astron and you you have your own heavy mineral sands mine in development in a Bahia of part of Brazil Correct. and when I added that all together on a piece of paper it looked to me like your company has undertaken one billion dollars of capital expenditure to develop all the sources in the next three to five years, okay? Yep. Uh, again, I have to emphasize to our listeners, this is called, excuse me, I'm an old man, I, I don't know the modern rules. This is separating the men from the boys, okay? Energy fuels is not just said, gee, if we can find a billion dollars, maybe we'll do this. And I, I, in my opinion, you've located the billion dollars and, and your projects are underway. And th there is no comparison with energy fuels. The companies in the rare space, for example, in North America, you have you have one you have one producer that has extremely good financial. That would be called energy fuels. Everyone else is maybe a, a wannabe. I'm, I'm going to get a lot of pushback on this, but so what? The only real company, in my opinion, in this space is Energy Fuels. So, uh, would you like to add anything else to to my, uh, you know, my lionizing of you? Well, I, I appreciate your kind words. Again, I'm not going to, uh, you know, provide commentary on any others that are out there. I'm, you know, again, we're focused right. on our own business plan, of course. Um, but yeah, as you pointed out, uh, we have acquired these three heavy mineral sand deposits in the in the southern hemisphere. Um, which are going to provide uh, rare earth feed to our White Mesa mill. In addition, they're going to be uh, uh, supplying uh, uh, titanium and zirconium uh, minerals to the world as well. And you, you mentioned that there's, um, you know, probably about a billion dollars of capital to get those projects up and running. But honestly, the 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 value that is going to be unlocked uh, by making that investment is is quite staggering. It's in the tens of billions of dollars range. Keeping in mind, Jack, that that those mines are actually very good just as titanium zirconium mines. For mm -hmm. instance, uh, uh, you know, just as an example, the Toleara project in, uh, in Madagascar that we just acquired uh, through our acquisition of base resources. Uh, base had done a uh, definitive feasibility study on that project a couple of years ago, uh, which showed it, it had a $1 billion NPV at, ten, at a, I believe it was a discount rate of 12%. So a very high discount rate to account for some of the risks associated with Madagascar. Um, just on the titanium and zirconium, right? And so that doesn't include the uh, the rare earths. They they updated that pre, uh, that feasibility study and it added a pre feasibility study on monazite, where they would simply be producing a monazite concentrate and selling it into global markets, which honestly would be China. Um, that doubled the NPV of that project to two billion dollars. Now, what we're doing at Energy Fuels is that we can actually unlock even more value by not just selling a monazite concentrate out into the world, but actually importing that monazite into the United States, uh, cracking and leaching it, separating it, potentially even uh, making metals and alloys and magnets in the United States. So, I mean, the, 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 
the value proposition just on that one project alone is quite staggering. And it's similar uh, for the other projects you mentioned, the uh, uh, Donald project in Australia and the Bahia project in Brazil. So I just think that energy fuels is probably just you know, in an exceptional position to unlock the value of those heavy mineral sand projects. Um, and again, kind of the kind of the little secret out there in the rare earth space is that if you're in rare earths, you're also kind of by default in the in the in the uranium and thorium space, <laughs> because pretty much every single major rare earth bearing mineral has uranium and thorium in it. And every non-Chinese company out there seems to have run into issues with radionuclides in their process. Um, so it just makes all the sense in the world to do this at, at an existing uranium processing facility and one that's actually located in the United States. Well, it, as a final comment, I'm going to say this. The best uh, mineral for rare earths has always been monazite. The impediment has always been what you just discussed. Okay, your company is, is managing to solve both. And uh, that's, that's the future. Uh, so thank you very much for the time this morning. And I, I understand you're on your way to uh, Malaysia. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck on that. It's a long plane ride. Thank uh, <laughs> and thanks again for, for the time. Oh, absolutely. Thanks again, Jack.